do a screen share. There we go. Great. Okay, so um, focus today again is best practices, and that will probably take us through the next lecture or two as well. The goal is to get you an understanding the best practices expected. And I've kind of listed them here. Um, these are laid out in the syllabus. More operationally yet, more actionably yet. In the syllabus, it says what's expected of you for each of these. So what I'm doing is elaborating on what's in the syllabus. Okay, um, please check it out. Uh, okay, so the first thing I want to talk about um, arguably the most important among a set of all super important items is the issue of accountable decisions. Uh, your projects are required, each of the projects, to have uh, a defined set of people in different positions. And I mentioned these previously as being of uh, a certain defined set. <laughs> So, first thing is the project manager. Okay. The project manager is the point person that I deal with for the project. It's, and, and more importantly, it's the point person for the stakeholder to deal with. It's uh, the person who takes responsibility for ensuring the project is coming together, um, answering questions about the project, where are missing items. Uh, and, and making sure that the stakeholder has an understanding of the project at each stage. It's also the person who typically coordinates the set of other parties here. Um, this is not the person who's taking the lead position in terms of software development, typically. They're often will have limited um, interactions with the code base. Not to say they don't look at it, they may look at it a lot, but their, their actual levels of contributions, the number of pull requests that they write and so on is gonna be quite, quite limited typically because they're involved at a higher level coordinating the activities of everyone else. Uh, they're probably doing the, the scheduling, you know, handle, handling issues with the outside stakeholders. I mentioned that making sure the work that has to get done does get done. So these milestones set up for the project within a given incremental deliverable, these binary meaning milestones that say, hey, is this job done or is it not? When I say done, I mean, is it, is the code written? Is it tested? Is it peer reviewed? Is it documented? Is it handed in? You know, um, and, and is there, did it go through continuous integration build and, and, uh, and pass the build? Um, was it smoke tested, et cetera? That's, that's something they're going to be keeping track of. What's being done, what's not being done? Are we coming in for a soft landing for this next incremental deliverable? Are things coming together? And if not, from a triage perspective, what are we going to cut? What things are we not going to be able to do? Um, and, uh, and making appropriate documentation, spreading knowledge around, et cetera. Often they're involved in coordinating meetings. Sometimes that's facilitated by others besides the, the, the project manager, but often it's a project manager responsibilities and making sure the peer reviews, including the formal inspections get done. Remember, every one of you is uh, responsible for serving as the point, as, as the contributor for a technical artifact that's formally inspected in the course of the semester. So formal inspection is an industry best practice. It's, if it's not truly revolutionized software development, it's not pretty close to it in terms of the quality implications, okay? So, so the, uh, the, the formal inspections in this course form uh, a key point of learning. And each of you needs to undergo, or rather each of your, each of you has to contribute deliverable, which undergoes formal peer review. Get started on that soon. I'll come back to this point, but it's something which can start soon. And, um, and typically those uh, formal inspections will be driven by the project manager as well as other types of peer review. 
you know, the use of pair programming or pair, uh, pair code reviews, et cetera. And finally, facilitating things. The job of a project manager is less ordering people about than just, you know, getting out of people's way, making sure they have the resources and knowledge to do their jobs, making sure that tutorials take place to spread knowledge around, that information is propagated throughout the, throughout the project on, on uh, decisions made or, or learning acquired by members of the team, et cetera. Okay, so project managers is a, a key resource. Risk officers are another one. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk more about risk management, but basically this is someone on a part-time basis. Project manager is full-time, risk manager is part-time. So, so their risk manager's job, it is, it's a risk manager's job to be proactively scanning for risks. That means either new types of risks or risks that were identified previously, to what degree are they coming about, or we say materialized? To what degree are they, you know, at risk of coming true? Like this person goes AWOL, like someone gets sick, like, you know, a server you're counting on goes down, or, uh, uh, an issue comes up with these two technologies that you chose not playing together nicely. A risk manager is basically trying to fly ahead of that plane. They're trying to make sure that you're not broadsided by things. Because if you don't aggressively manage risks, risks will aggressively manage you. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll bite you. Um, and, uh, you know, today's risk is tomorrow's problem. Uh, so risk manager's job is to sort of see those risks ahead of time, recognize them, head them off, okay? Um, or mitigate them, like, like put in place mechanisms so you can weather them better, make yourselves less vulnerable to them. The dev lead um, is really, you know, in, in charge of taking charge of the, the technical contributions, including design, uh, design of the system um, that could be architecting it. It can be uh, uh, lower level design, um, planning the interfaces between classes or, or elements of the system and, uh, and making sure that the code is getting contributed to implement those interfaces, okay? So the dev lead should be someone who has an interest in, in software development. And a test lead, which is required for this class is someone who has a, a real interest in um, in identifying quality issues with the project. Uh, those could be uh, bugs, could be defects. What other sorts of quality issues are there besides a, a bug or something we call a bug or a defect? Anyone? Yeah. What other sorts of quality concerns might there be besides like a, a defect, something where you wrote times instead of plus? Creativity? Yeah, the interactivity is often a key. It could be horribly slow, it could be non-responsive, it could be confusing, it could be, you know, almost impossible to read text because of the coloration. Um, it, it could be confusing. Um, those are all quality issues. And often to a stakeholder, those will be just as important as, you know, in giving the wrong number at some place in it because it makes it basically unusable. So a test lead's job is to kind of uh, work on to work on mechanisms that will help discover those issues, identify them, document them, and pass them to developers, make sure that they get fixed. Um, so they're involved in uh, sort of uh, making sure they're reproducible, getting testing in place that will find them at different levels. Okay, um, and and engaging in, in reproduction of the of the bugs and and making sure they're in the uh, the issue tracking system. Uh, okay, um, there's also a part time a part time position in the form of a build master. Okay, now a build master's job it's a part time job like the risk manager, but their job is basically to ensure that the system um, is uh, tracked over time by a continuous integration system that supports the, the evolving repo, the test suites associated with that repo, 
the deployment mechanisms and the build pipeline and deployment pipeline that are used by the system. Um, these are a lot of fancy words, uh, but um, I trust, you know, it, by the 371, time you get to 371, you probably got some inkling for what a lot of these mean. Um, how many people in here have used uh, uh, GitLab uh, quite a bit before? Okay, so that's, that's most. And GitHub, okay, small number, but still a good number. Um, are you familiar with um, the idea of uh, automated built pipeline as part of that? Is that something you've seen before? Like a pipeline that involves multiple stages? Maybe it involves uh, style checks, maybe it involves uh, containerization at a certain point to get a system ready for testing. Maybe it involves uh, deployment scripts to push it out to uh, servers or test, test deployment, uh, the recreation of databases. A build pipeline is typically a lot more than just compiling code. It involves a lot of other, other steps. And a lot of steps geared at, at quality assurance or geared at scalability, like a, a containerization type step. Um, and uh, the build master's job is to maintain this. Uh, I would recommend having a build master who's the same person throughout the, throughout the project. Um, we'll come back to this point, but uh, sometimes it's a rotating position to introduce the knowledge at different points in the uh, uh, within the semester to, to different people on the team. Um, you know, one or two other uh, points of note, um, underneath the test lead and underneath the dev lead uh, are typically teams. So there'll often be one or two testers besides the test lead on the team your size. And two, maybe three other developers besides the dev lead, okay? So the dev lead, it's a matter of accountability. It's a matter of ownership. They're taking ownership, making sure things are coming together, but they've got others to help them write the code. The test lead, they're working on to coordinate everything, but they're, they're working with the testers to make sure that the various tests get written. The unit test, the system test, the integration test, the, the tests at the level of, of acceptance potentially. That's all part of the testing team's responsibility. Um, and there should be a, a triage team um, that you should at least consider. I'm not gonna require it, but a triage team basically, their job is to sort of handle um, mitigating the risks uh, when you're getting close to a deliverable. So what, if I say triage, give me a sense. That's exactly right. Yeah, in, in medicine, we actually have a, uh, a CTAS score that's assigned. If you ever go into an emergency room, there's a Canadian um, triage acuity scale, which they'll, they'll sort of look at you, talk with you, and they'll rank you zero to five in terms of the score. And basically, that measure is like how, you know, like how great your, system, your situation is. And they will take you in into the beds in the emergency area, depending on that score. Um, so some of you like me may have waited there for a couple hours at times. Um, I've been with people who I wheel in and they don't even take their card. They don't even interview them. They just look at like their blood oxygen saturation and they, they take them into a room and immediately put them in the bed. It's because of trio. They're on the fly determining what's the severity of the situation, how many beds do we have free, um, you know, can we take this person in? And they're prioritizing things that are, uh, that are the highest risks and um, where the situation will benefit from it, you know, uh, soon through, through dealing with it quickly. 
So a triage team's job as a deadline approaches is to kind of juggle the various competing priorities and figure out how can we do a deliverable that you know is uh, has the least harm done. So in other words, fewer bugs, but uh, uh, as much functionality. Maybe it means cutting back functionality, right? Just saying like, it'd be really nice to have this function in there. Stakeholders would really like it, but we just can't afford it because this is defect in it, which is too problematic. If we could just leave it out, we can ship everything else and it's fine. Or maybe you say, look, we're willing to put this out with this, priority three bug and this priority two bug that are known. We'll document them, we'll give workarounds and we'll contribute them. But uh, basically we're still getting the functionality up. So, so you're putting out workarounds. Triage team's job is to kind of manage that process. And like in the emergency room, they're doing it kind of live on the fly as new things are being discovered. And sometimes they'll do what's called directed triage which is where they'll, they'll say, let's, let's go through all the bug reports that have been submitted, winnow down, get rid of the duplicates, get rid of things that are outdated because they're for old versions of the system, get rid of all the ones that seem to be based on misunderstandings, and really try to get down to how many serious bugs there are at different levels. So they'll actually wade through all the issues in the issue reports, and try to get a sense like where are we at it's kind of like interviewing the patient doing their 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 basic measurements of the emergency room and saying how serious the situation are we in um sticking a pulse of oximeter measuring their blood oxygen levels doing their pulse etc okay so that was a countable position so i need all of these in your teams and uh you know it's uh it's something where at least two of these, the, the risk manager and the build master don't have to be full-time physicians, but often the build master is. Because build master uh, skill set is pretty specialized. I wanna, I wanna emphasize, it. this is really important. It's a matter of philosophy as much as it is a matter of, of, of practical reality. Testing is a specialized art, okay? Like, People can be really, really, really good at testing. Testing leads and testing testers within this class should not be viewed as kind of runner up positions for development. Testing is an art in and of itself. It is a specialized field where people can excel in ways that, you know, development uh, folks just don't have the, the same skills. It's a different type of expertise than development. And you should, be willing to invest in this here. This is not, a, these are not second class uh, positions. These are just as important in my mind as development. And if you look at where projects fail for this course, if you look at where projects often fail in industry, it's often as much on the quality side and the testing side as it is on the dev side. Um, so, so make sure you invest in the test, test positions. This is not a class where you can be able to kind of throw up some smoke and say, we did some testing. I wanna see the serious engagement intellectually and, and building confidence that you've tested system functionality, that you haven't left a lot of holes in your testing scheme and that it's been, it's taken place at multiple levels. Okay, so, so that was uh, accountable positions. Any questions about accountable positions? Any issues you want to know about a combo position? What's expected of you? Anyone? Yeah. Can your name? Um, Lee. Lee. Thank you. Can your developers, um, can they also do testing? I don't have to help you. Yeah. yeah, great question. Okay. So typically within um, dev teams, there's testing done. So. So if we think about testing, the word testing, um, it, it's overly simplistic characterization of actually a lot of subparts, okay? And, and one of the things that hides is the fact that testing is, is actually accomplished by different parties for different purposes. So um, some testing 
namely unit testing is typically a feature of developers day-to-day uh, -day experience. Um, I would strongly, strongly urge you to make use of test-driven development. I don't know if you, if you folks have come test-driven development at 370, okay? Um, uh, so there, you know, you're, you're first putting in place the test. You're thinking through what, what conditions it has to satisfy, what you're writing. What, what would it mean for, to, to create a, a successful, you know, a successful implementation? Um, and it should fail. <laughs> Those tests initially, it's like, a, you know, it's, it's, it's half baked. And, and then you make it run. You make the test run successfully, and then you make it run, right? You improve it. Um, so that's test driven development. And that's typically a dev side issue The devs are management. But there's a lot more to testing than that. And the test team really comes in when you go beyond that to deal with things like integration testing. So you're taking components of different developers, putting them together. When it comes to issues like uh, certain types of mocking or fakes, um, have, have you folks uh, talked about mocking in, in 370? Is that part of your experience? Mocking? Okay, so um, mocking is, is a term for approaches that have gone over the past many decades uh, through different names. Uh, when I was young, when I was your age, you know, those ones, right? Uh, we had ones and zeros then. One of the oldest backups here, the only zeros. Um, so, yeah, I'm younger. Um, <laughs> um, we, we, were, we were beyond the age of homo habilis. Um, so, uh, back then it was called study. So, you kind of create a fake version of something that would have kind of a minimal implementation. It's kind of like a throwaway um, test implementation that's a placeholder until you get a real implementation in place. Um, and then it went through names like fake faking. Um, so you have a fake version of it. And uh, more recently, uh, we have we have uh, mocking. Now, mocking is actually more sophisticated than fake sort of stuff. Um, there's whole technologies built around um, around uh, mocking. Um, they put into place mechanisms so you can create what is in essence a fake version of a part of the system that looks and feels a little bit like the real system and do so without actually, in many cases, writing code. You just said, you specify some rules it has, to, it has to occupy. So if you look like look at frameworks like JMOC, for example, um, or JSMOC, um, or you look at uh, Synon, I think, in the React Native context, um, or React context, uh, there's a set of technologies that basically allow you to declaratively specify what behaviors the mock should have. And so the mock, you know, should, um, should always return like random integers and it should take in two arguments that should be checked to make sure they're both greater than zero and not equal to each other or something like that. You could specify these rules for a, for a mock. And that allows you to test things that depend on that component without yet having written that component. And it allows you to be confident that those things that depend on it will work properly if the component is working properly. And it lets you spot errors more quickly. So um, mocking is often the province of the test team. They specialize in, in and more specialized tools. Um, integration testing, system testing, especially. Is that word familiar to people or that phrase? System testing? Okay, it's higher level testing, often end to end testing, like it's testing not just one component. The devs might test their little neck of the woods, right? Their little piece of the system. End to end testing or system testing will be testing broad use cases. The user goes through, you know, they open a document, they type some text into it, they format it, they save it, and they print it, you know, something like that. It's a use case, 
uh, end to end, and you want to make sure the system works properly. That's that's based on test scripts, which are written by the test team, not typically by developers. So test the test team will be writing these test scripts. Um, acceptance tests often will involve project manager and test team, and sometimes the stakeholder to delineate the acceptance tests. Um, so so these different types of testing. Uh, kind of have different parties involved and different sides uh, that take primary responsibility. Is the test team involved in some unit testing? Yeah, they can, they can add some unit tests, but often it's the dev team that will take the lead with unit tests. Hope that's helpful. Um, and that's what I'd recommend for this class. Great question. And, and again, the name was Lee. Horrible names. Around the time the class ends. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Okay. So let's go on to the next best practice, which is risk management, involves risk management. Okay. Um, this sounds really dull, but it's it's a general principle. Mark. You've heard Murphy's law, right? Um, what's Murphy's law? Anyone say? <laughs> And anything that can't go wrong will go wrong, and sometimes it's extended, right? And exactly the wrong time. And there's a certain poetic truth to that, but the truth is we, we can't control certain types of risks in the world, but we can make ourselves less vulnerable to them. There's things we can undertake that will mean something that's going wrong will affect us a lot less because we spot it a lot sooner or we have a backup plan in place or you know we have uh, a, a work a workaround plan to handle it or we're testing under very controlled circumstances or sometimes there are things we avoid doing that will trigger it um, and therefore we sidestep it so risk management and being aware of risks is, is one of these keys to success in life. Um, it's, it's, you know, something that you can apply more generally. Um, and, you know, the, there are a couple adages here. Um, today's risk is tomorrow's problem, something I said earlier. Um, and uh, Jerry Weinberg commented quick one time, this other comment I was paraphrasing. If you don't aggressively attack project risk, they're gonna attack you, right? Um, it's it's a difficult thing, but arguably the foremost thing that trips up student teams in this class is risk. What do I mean by risk? Can I put forward um, sort of a practical definition? What do I mean by risk when it, when it comes to software product management? What's a risk? Anyone? Okay, I mean, currently, I'll say it's uncertainty with the promise. Okay, uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's some uncertainty, but it's not just, well, you know, I don't know if the backside of the moon is, you know, has big impact right over the middle, something like that. Uh, it's not just some um, abstract uncertainty, it's an uncertainty that has consequences, um, that, that comes at a cost. It, it has, and I don't mean monetary cost, but it, you know, it has it has some impact, some negative impact. Um, and good risk management, like um, being able to savvily spot risks, prevent risks, and work to mitigate or contain risks through contingency planning, is really what what is the fundamental driver for success technically and project. But I mean, the basic deal is look, you, you may have heard, maybe some of you have taken, you know, classes over at Edward School of Business, this trade off between um, risk and return. You ever heard that term? Yeah. Yeah, so you have this, you know, look, you get higher returns if you're willing to take more risks, right? Um, if you're willing to invest in that, that start up with big ideas and a lot of potential, maybe you get a really big return on your investment. 
Um, and if you're willing to invest in this nascent technology that could revolutionize semiconductor, you know, production, maybe you'll you'll get really really big uh, good gain from that. Um, that trade off between risk and return, you know, points to a very real thing out there, and really companies take advantage of that by investing in risky things. And how do they succeed in that? Why aren't they just going under, you know, a few trades? It's what, what allows them to succeed is good risk management. It's the ability to say, we're gonna invest in this risk. Intel will invest in this new submicron lithography or what have you, um, because they have really good risk management processes. And so they undertake risky, but uh, high return investments because they know that they'll they'll spot issues sooner and nimbly respond to them, or they'll head off the issues, uh, prevent these issues from materializing. It's really the ability to undertake good risk management that it can allow you to succeed in really risky places that can be allow you to be a first mover at a, at a corporate level. So risk management is really important um, at the level of small startups entrepreneurship, uh, investment, et cetera. Um, it really allows you to avoid many problems. And if problems arise, you can kind of weather them, make yourself less vulnerable to them, okay? Um, and, and you can plan more effectively in the context of risk management, despite, despite these projects uh, being there. Now, the history of software project has massive risks associated with it. Anyone want to give me, for, for software management, um, um, software project manager, what are some major risks? What are some risks might apply for your projects? Give me a couple of risks. What, what things could go wrong? What uncertainties are there with consequences? Yeah. Uh, time risk. Name? Uh, ransom. Ransom. Yeah. Uh, so time risk, yeah. So you might like run over time. Things don't converge in time for the projects. Good. Excellent. Big issue. Almost all projects will run up against it. Uh, what's another one? So that's, by the way, that's a, a risk, I'd say, manifestation. There's, there, like, that's a symptom of, of the risks. You know, you're, you're running out of time. What, what, what risk would be causing that? If you take it back one level, so I like that a lot. Because that's one of the major ways we, we see the adverse consequences of race. It's like we're gonna go to the deadline, it's not coming together. But what would cause that? What sort of uncertainties would lead you to be like in that situation? Yeah, and just making the efforts to develop something. Yeah, underestimating the effort. So the truth is we're gonna have a we're gonna have a module in this class on excavation. And the truth is <laughs> Software developers are pretty bad at uh, estimating. Um, and there's there's at least two or three levels to this. Number one, we give estimates that are off base. Number two, we often overstate our confidence. So so you know if we ask about how uncertain we are, we'll say, oh, we're not that uncertain. But in fact, we need you know we're like way off. We should be more uncertain about our estimates. Um, and thirdly, we estimate almost always underestimate the time rather than overestimate. Uh, because, well, amongst other things, it's more flattering to say, oh, I can do that. I can, I can do that in you know, two weeks and really becomes two months. Uh, uh, when I was at MIT as an undergraduate, the, the, the adage used to be if, if you want to get a good reading on software development, actual development times. Um, Take the estimate, say the estimate is three weeks, okay? Um, multiply by three, get nine weeks. Scale up by a, a unit. So if you have weeks, nine weeks, it becomes nine months and add two. <laughs> All hundred months, you know, from three weeks. And it was a joke, of course, but the point is we're really bad at estimating estimating timing. So that's that's one thing um, that, that could cause that. We're poor estimate. The same project, what are my words? Same project could be viewed as successful or failure if upfront they say it'll take 
three months versus it will take three weeks. The project can be viewed, same delivery, everything um, of time. Maybe it, it finishes in you know two and a half months. It can be viewed as a grand success if you promise three months. It can be viewed as a grand failure if you promise three weeks. The problem was not in the project. The problem was in the estimate and the expectation set at the beginning. This is a big, big issue. It's this issue of, of over-promising or promising on an unrealistic time frame. Your name? Ashanti. Uh, Ashanti? Ashanti. Ashanti. Okay, thank you. Um, so other types of risks that might materialize, might make you late, for example. Yeah. Uh, budget risk. Budget risk. Uh, ranting? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, so, yes, yeah, so you can have budget related risks, is right. Um, uh, those, can, those can mean you run out of money before you can finish. Uh, you can't pay the developers to finish it. You've promised to deliver for a certain budget and you can't pay. And so developers start leaving, and that puts you in a bad situation because now often you're. You're, you're, you're late. What's another type of risk that might materialize in your project? Hopefully, you want to plenty of risk in your project issues. But what, what are some problems that might occur in your project that would make it? So, like resource management, suppose like if one person is working on like um, yeah. on the, as a configuration master, and suppose like something happened to him and he's not able to like so attend for a week or something like that. So, because of that, the project can be delayed, but if he yeah. has a proper work instruction that someone else can work Good. on it, Good. so those kind of things can like come under the risk management. Excellent. So you 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 well, like there are several components, right? Um it it could be that someone's not available in place if you roll. But that's not just like some bolt of lightning that destroys our project, fries everything, and we go home and cry, right? It's it's something we're leaving ourselves open to. We could have probably mitigated that a lot. We could have prevented it from being a major problem by putting in place um, mechanisms that would document things or have other people shadow that person. Like, in other words, acquire some of their knowledge uh, so that if they get sick, there's always someone else to take over. You know, through this process of shadowing, having every person build manager. Uh, the person who's doing the risk management, having someone else, someone involved in that may mean that if they get sick, someone else could take over. And this is a really important component of risk management. Um, having documentation in place, having some specification of, of where things are and what's to be expected and keeping that up to date. So those are ways of defraying the risk. So, so when you're handling risk, um, you know, there's a couple steps you want to go through. Risk identification. Um, you want to ask how, and, I, and I'm not asking for anything too fancy here, but like how exposed is this risk? Is, is, is this a really big issue or is it a minor issue? It can be a big issue if it's very likely to occur, or maybe it's not so likely to occur, but it would be disastrous if it did. And often you multiply those together at some level to get a sense of, of how bad it is. You get kind of the expected badness of it. The expected value of the loss. Um, and then you can, can sort of handle it. And I want to concentrate on two of these issues for Hamlin. I mean, there are other options, like just say, look, we're going to accept the risk that, um, you know, there's, uh, there'll be a, a loss of some of our developers um, in the course of the semester. Um, but there are things you can do um, that are really important to help lower vulnerability. One is mitigation efforts. And this is basically doing something up front, and you could put in place contingency plans. The idea with contingency plans is you put in place a mechanism that if you need it, you know exactly what you're going to do. So here, it's not so much that you have everything already set up that you immediately fail over it. You all, you have a plan that everyone's in agreement on, clear about. So if something happens, you enact that plan rather than running around and figure out what are we gonna do? Let's call a meeting, let's, how are we gonna handle this? You're at least very clear about what you're going to do in this case. So contingency planning 
basically is a contingent, meaning a conditional um, type of planning. So it allows you to act quickly. And uh, for, for things that don't require a lot of effort to, to enact, um, uh, once, once the contingency comes about, this is really good. If it's something which has a long time associated with it, like you gotta go train and learn all about another system as an alternative to the one you're using, you know, you're going to be in bad shape because you only act on it when it happens, and then you're going to be spending weeks coming up to speed on the new system. By contrast, if it's fairly short term, like you know who's going to take over the dev lead position if the dev lead gets sick or the, the build master position, it can be pretty effective. Um, and contingency planning is one of those major tasks that I'd like you to build into your risk management plan. So I will, as part of this class, require you to come up with a list of top 10 risks and update them every deliverable, every deliverable. I need one, two, three, four, five. I need you to specify what are the top 10 risks. And I want you to reflect them. You know, like, what, what are the major risks now? As the term goes on, they'll change, right? Early on, you'll be worried, perhaps, that people will drop the class. Once the last drop the passes, maybe that will start to retreat as an issue. Later, you'll start worrying about, you know, people at the end of term being super busy for ID5. The, the risks will change. And I want you to keep track of them. And I want you to say for each risk, what do you, what do, you do um, to handle it? Uh, presuming you've thought about it, presuming you have some plan in place. Maybe it's a contingency plan. You're going to when this happens, you're going to do this. Or if it happens, you're going to do that. The other is mitigation. And the idea here is look, you, you invest up front. Contingency planning, you only do it if it's called. Mitigation, you invest up front to either lessen the chance the risk comes about, or you have invested such that if it comes about, it does less damage. Or both. So you make that upfront assessment. You make it less likely you'll be whammed by that risk. Okay. Um, so you're investing the resources up front, not just waiting for it to happen. Okay. Um, and you know, for example, um, maybe you're not sure if React Native will meet your need. So you start, you have a parallel person who starts uh, looking at um another alternative platform maybe it's a uh, progressive web apps for both progressive web apps pwas so these are uh sort of hybrid web technology give you a kind of app-like experience with web technologies for example it's a major player. so cnn for example has a progressive web app uh, for their apps on on um, uh, android and iphone i think both of them um, another another technology in that space for a cross platform will be Google Flutter. So maybe you have someone coming up to speed on that um, as a mitigation measure uh, in case React Native doesn't deliver for you. You have already invested that. If you only did that, if uh, React Native bombs out on you, you're in trouble. But you've already done it up front here. Um, and you know sometimes you you combine it with contingency planning like. You'll fail over to Google Flutter if uh, if um, React Native isn't uh, doesn't prove uh, that effective. Okay, um, so what do I expect of you in this area? I'm looking for a risk officer. I meant that mentioned that. What is that risk officer doing? Well, they're engaged in what's called risk scanning, and I I, I mentioned two types of risk scanning. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, scanning for risks that you had previously conceptualized, you had, you had thought about them. Maybe someone's going to drop them. Maybe someone's going to get sick. You know, maybe um, there'll be big merge conflicts from this, this big set of, uh, set of check ins that are occurring before ID2 or what have you. You've identified those before, and you're trying to see are they coming about. You're just scanning for them, like or this person is. We haven't heard from them for a while. 
you know, on, on where they may be going, hey, well, let's send them an email, check if they're okay, let's try to contact them on Slack, let's let's get them on Discord or what have you. Um so risk scanning, that's one type of risk scan. Looking for risks that you've previously identified that may be coming about, maybe materialized. The second type of risk scanning involves looking for new types of risks, new risks of new new breeds uh, that that may be um, maybe brewing. Maybe late stage ID four, ID five, you introduce some new technologies. Um, maybe you incorporate printing in your system or something, and you put in a new technology for that, and you're worried. Is it going to play well with Jest for testing? Or is it going to is it going to um, be happy with uh, the earlier versions of iPhone or whatever? Um, here you're looking for new types of risks, and you'll be scanning for those. It's part of the job of the risk officer. They should be giving an updated risk plan every deliverable. You should have risk that should be a prioritized risk plan, like a top ten uh, from most important to least important. By the way, with risks, often we, I mentioned earlier, often we classify them as to the sort of their likelihood and how bad they would be. And sometimes um, I multiply them together to get a sort of combined score. Um, these are rough subjective numbers, but they give us some sense. And finally, close morals. Um, so this is your chance to reflect on what risk came about, how could we have avoided them, how could we have made ourselves less vulnerable to them? We, again, there's a lot of risks in the world that we don't control. And for them, we can make ourselves less vulnerable. There's a lot we can do. Typically. Um, okay. And those who can make themselves less vulnerable often reap the rewards because those are the ones who, who go on and succeed. Okay, let's talk about risk informed uh, incremental delivery. The idea of incremental delivery is in many ways a matter of risk management it's doing things in a way that reflects risks and value delivery right um so it's delivering things in a small set of steps so that you collapse risks you eliminate risks as soon as possible and you get in place the most valuable functionality either from the standpoint of it's delivering value to the user, or it will allow you to build other things that will deliver lots of value to the user. Okay, so incremental delivery um, is this step by step sort of rollout of, of the system. And one of the big risks being dealt with here is that the reality of software development that often the stakeholder. Often the stakeholder doesn't really know what they want to go to see or see something kind of incomplete. Now that, that sounds like a pessimistic view of human cognitive capacity, but I would say it's true for everyone in this room as well. Often we have trouble envisioning with crystal clarity exactly what we want. We need some experimentation with it, some experience of it, some trying it out before we often really sharpen our sense of what's acceptable. Incremental delivery aids that, right? Um, so you, you sort of roll out a piece, the stakeholder tries it on for size, and they talk about their needs, and they talk about anything that's changed on their side. Maybe they, their organization changed its priorities, or maybe they've spoken to some other parties or what have you, and they'll opine about what's the next big priority. Um, so incremental delivery gives you the ability to replan after each iteration. Um, you can more easily estimate the task lengths. This is one of the risks mentioned earlier by Martin, I think. Um, you're often off base and you're, um, in your judgments of time, uh, you underestimate the time it will take. And one of the one of the big risks there is if you're estimating bigger chunks of time, often you're far more off. If you're thinking about things that take on the order of a week, you tend to think very concretely. You say, you know, Tuesday I've got to take half a day off for this. Um, 
and Wednesday I can't work late because of this other thing. Um, and you know, I'm really uncertain about whether this is going to come together in time. So when we think concretely about small bits of work, often our estimates are much more informed than if we're thinking about like months of work. We just fool ourselves with months of work. It's, it's really hard to know how long they're going to take. If we're talking about small chunks, we can, we can often be more, uh, more on, on mark with our, our estimates. Um, and you know, incremental delivery delivers value all along. It builds morale. Stakeholder gets confidence in things, and they get clear about really what's being assembled. Um, and allows you to do risk assessment along the way. Um, so uh, generally speaking, incremental delivery is a really, really valuable process in terms of risk management and in terms of um, ad adaptation, nimbleness. Okay, so spiral model um, of software development, which is emphasized in many types of software development methodologies, allows you to drive it according to risks. And basically, you try to decrease risks and you increase the value delivered uh, over time. I'm not going to dwell on this a lot, but what I'm expecting from you here is five risk and value delivered deliverable. So I want to know, you know, like why you why are you choosing this step before that one? And maybe it's based on stakeholder feedback. Maybe it's because you need this in place to build these other things. Maybe it's because you want to make sure that these three technologies play well together. I'm going to mention something that's not in these slides right here, but I want you to know, which is a really important part of risk uh, management on a technical project for software development. And that concerns spike prototypes, okay? We're out of time here, but uh, I'll put it on the board. Spike prototype. Anyone want to know? When I say a prototype, what am I meaning? Anyone? What's a prototype of a system? Yeah. Like basically a beta version of some on there. Yeah, okay. But I, I want to sharpen that because the word prototype, it is used in a couple of different ways. But one of the biggest ways that it's used is actually a little bit different from that. You, you've got it right in that it's not a complete version of a system. It's kind of not fully baked. But often people use this very specific word to mean a throwaway. Okay. Um, it's actually designed to be built to throw away. And a spike prototype is something that's built to be thrown away to investigate a very specific technical issue. Its goal is actually not to, to kind of um, mock out the whole system or play out the whole system, but its goal is to make sure that certain technologies play nicely together, work together, so that we know how they work well. Its goal is to, to, to feel, fill in our ignorance about certain things. It's to, to make us more and more informed. You know, do these work okay together? How does this work in this technology? How do you do persistent data in a stateless technology or what have you? Um, so spike prototypes are this key um, practice that we undertake to head off technical risks. We undertake a spike prototype to try out a strategy before actually putting in place code that we're going to keep. We, we create some throwaway code, some toss away code, just to try out these ideas. Please consider these, particularly for things like ID1, ID2, because you can head off major risks. So when we talk about risk driven development, and lessening risks. Often you're putting in place spike prototypes to try a lot of ideas, try out your understanding. Um, and I will view that as a contribution. It may be throwaway code, but it's really valuable to head off risks because it helps make sure that you don't start building something and building something, building something only to find these technologies don't find this. So please consider spike prototypes in order to head off risks associated with your projects. Okay. Okay, we're at time for lecture here. Uh, I want to remind us that at four o'clock upstairs, 205A, I think you've got that before. Um, 
that we're going to have this tutorial. We're going to have project pictures. So we got it. We got five, five to seven minutes here. I'll see you up there in the studio with you, and we'll continue. With Let me just know after that those presentations, you folks should meet with your teams. Do a skills inventory if you have a ton plan about your background and talk about the project. Okay? Talk about project ideas. Be up there for five minutes. Yes, I can. Um, so, uh, sort of human theater like risks yeah. associated with management. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be glad to comment on that also. Yeah, you want me to know everything you want to say that technology is related to No. Um, no, you don't, but you, what you would need.